Ross Lyons' re-stumping job goes to new heights. The gun recruit dominating the Brownlow and why the rising star is now a race in two. All that and more on the round so far. But Kane Corns, we must start with the Giants and they look like a serious football side right now. Yeah, I think that's the word, Mitch. Serious is absolutely correct. And it was in the midfield that they got it done tonight. I wanted to speak about the trio of midfielders that the Giants have got. So we know the names that have left and Ward's got their knee injury, so he won't play for the rest of the year. But Shield and Scully out. It's these three that have really stepped up. If that's possible for Cornelio to step up and he kicked four tonight, that man Taranto is a genuine star, a future star of the game. And there you have it as well. Josh Kelly, we know, has been a gun for a while now and looks like he's staying. So those three, and I want to add in DeBoer as well and give him a mention because I think that really rounds out the balance of the midfield. But they went to Sydney uh, and completely beat Sydney at their own game tonight. They lost Phil Davis tonight, laid out through that ankle, but Jeremy Cameron's up and firing in attack. Looks like there's no holes with this side at the moment. Do they deserve to be right up there in the Premiership Tour? Absolutely, yeah. Right up there with Collingwood and Geelong and West Coast, if you like, in terms of favouritism. I think they're every chance. And what Leon Cameron and the coaching staff have done, and the players, is unbelievable, really. I look at the performance tonight... They're a tough footy side, and tough footy sides win premierships. So they go there, they win contested ball by 34, ground balls by 26. Sydney's always been strong in that area. They win the tackles, and then they kick 14-7 from Sydney's turnovers, which says their pressure was just elite tonight. So not too many teams go and completely smash Sydney at their own game, and that's what the Giants did tonight. One side that used to be tough were the Swans. Right now, seven of their last eight at home, all losses. What's happened to this side? It looks like the depth's just completely fallen out of them. Well, you just can't compete as an interstate club when your record is that. So one win, you'll see it there, round 20 against uh, Collingwood, just two by two points. That's the worst record of any interstate side in their last game, eight games at home. W- worse than uh, the Gold Coast and, and all the other interstate clubs. So. Yeah, it's a massive issue for them. It has been for a long time. I'm not as critical as the Swans. I just think they've been a remarkable footy club. They've been up for so long. We've all been probably saying for the last three or four years, well, the dip's going to come. Well, the dip's finally here, but, I mean, it's, a, it's an even competition. So I'm not as critical of them, but it looks like it's going to be a, a pretty uh, dismal year for them. No buddy tonight out with hamstring soreness. They're 1-5 and five now, the Swans. No such dramas over in the West for Ross Lyon. His Dockers side flying into second place on the ladder. And their key forwards have been crying out for them for a long time. All of a sudden, they've got three at their disposal. Oh, it's an absolute luxury for a midfielder to look up and have some tall targets inside 50. So 13 marks inside 50 for Fremantle tonight. There's Tabner. This one here from Lobb. They haven't had a player probably since Pavlich. And it wasn't really Pav's go to stand there and take a contested mark. He was more a leading player. They've had a crack at trying to get them. We know the names that they've missed out on. But just that there, as a midfielder to look up when you're 70 metres out from goal and have three genuine tall marking targets to kick to is a luxury and one that Ross Lyon probably hasn't had in his whole time as coach. So, look, he needs some credit because we can be pretty hard on Ross Lyon for, for his game style and things like that. But this year, to have them 4-2 and two and sitting second on the ladder with the games they've got still to come at Optus Stadium, they're in a really good position. It's a horrible month for the Dogs. They've lost their last four after winning the first two. But nothing was going to wreck the party tonight for David Mundy. Mundy 3 hundy, and he got the chocolates <laughs> in his 300th game. Oh, it, was just a, it was a typical performance, wasn't it? 28 possessions, he had seven tackles, he kicked two goals. We'll see that one there. That came off a crunching bump that he laid down the field. He drifted forward, gut running like he has done for 300 games and finished. He's always been a very accurate set shot for goal, as we're seeing there. But... Oh, I just think it's been a, an outstanding career and he's finally probably getting the credit for being an, under, um, uh, an underrated player for a long time. Turns 34 yep. in July, but I'm not sure he's ever played better. So uh, he'll go around next year and, and so he should. Just on the dogs, you saw them live last week. Are they a bottom four team legitimately now? Not sure they're bottom four. Uh, I thought they were, they were in it tonight and they had their opportunities. They, they lack some class. The forward line, they, they're crying out for a key target down there. Norton misfired again tonight after being really quiet and well beaten by Jones last week. So, got issues forward of the ball. Um, they, they won't make finals, but they're probably somewhere between 8th and 12th, I would think. OK, the Crows, they had issues in front of the ball up until last week. They're now firing 17 marks inside 50 tonight. No Josh Jenkins, but no such worries. Yeah, well, this was their big strength when they made the grand final a couple of years ago. The marks inside 50 and the way the forward line functioned. Well, they've been the worst side in the competition for marks inside 50 so far this year. But finally, in the last two weeks, they've got going. And it's been a result of the ball used up the field. Tex was on fire tonight. He had a, a really strong performance. Himmelberg, that man we're seeing on screen, has come in as Jenkins' replacement. He kicked two goals. Look, 
Jenkins is in my best team. If you're picking a team to play in a grand final tomorrow, I'm picking Jenkins over Himmelberg. So I think he comes back. He kicked three in the sand for whether it's next week or in the future. But Crows feeling a lot better about themselves um, in the last fortnight. They play Fremantle at home next week. So another opportunity to win three in a row before leading into a big showdown. You tip them for the flag. Do they still make the eight? I think they make the eight from here. Yeah, I think a pretty reasonable draw. They've still got to play St Kilda again. They play Gold Coast again. And they're going to be tough to beat at home. So right now they're inside the eight and I think they'll finish there at uh, at the end of the year. We all love a bit of character. There's plenty of that getting around at the Saints. MP400. <laughs> it's Matthew Parker. That's what he self-titled himself <laughs> for his own nickname. He's got all character. And how about this bit of spunk today? Well, they need it, don't they, the Saints? I mean, they need some spark and some excitement. Look at that. That uh, contested mark can sit on someone's head. He can do it on the ground. And what a highlight. It's real. We only touched it ten times today, but kicked three goals. And He's going to bring the Saints fans through the turnstiles for a long, long time. What a pick-up he was, yeah. mature age from Perth. So uh, he, was a, he was one of the good stories for the Saints today. And him playing that forward line's allowed the likes of Gresham to play in the midfield. Now, this looked potentially horrible today for Jack Loney when he went down, hyper-extending his knee. The early word is that he's avoided the ACL came, but this could have been horrible. It was, and your heart sank for a moment when you saw it because he's a player that's worked so hard on his game. I reckon he was at the genuine crossroads at the end of last year. They took some time to even offer him a contract, the Saints, but you can see how hard he's been working. And he's formed a real weapon for St Kilda with Gresham and, and these types, Billings are small forwards for the Saints. So... Uh, great news that he has avoided that ACL and it looks like a medial, they're saying. Yep. So if it's a nasty one, maybe four to six, but uh, he'll be back this year, which is great news for him. Now, the Lions got their fourth win on the board today in the Q clash. They were made to work hard for it. Four wins. Does Lockie Neal now have 12 Brownlow votes? Yeah, well, I think he, he'd be certainly favourite at the moment. I, I think Travis Boak's had a very good year in polls traditionally well. He would have got the three on Friday night against North. But this is what I love about Brisbane. It's their midfield power. So they've got some young midfielders who have got leg speed that push forward and hit the scoreboard. So they're the best team in the competition right now at scoring from stoppages. It's one thing to be strong around the clearances and win them, but you want to score from them. So they, once again today, they kick seven goals, five to the Suns 3-2 directly from uh, stoppages. And we're seeing the names. You know them, Berry, McCluggage, Zorko. They're all goal-kicking midfielders that, when they go in there, have the weapon to push forward and kick goals, which is always threatening to the opposition. Four wins now. We saw yeah. how poor they were last week. Are they making finals? You're putting me on the spot with every team making finals. Someone's going to have to miss out. I don't think Brisbane will yeah, get I there. Yeah, I think they miss out as I well. Don't, I didn't have them in there at the start of the year. I'm going to stick to that. But they're showing improvement, which is, I think, all that Lions fans can ask for. All right, the fallout continues from Anzac Day. The booing. Scott Pendlebury copped it from the Essendon fans. Whether it was for him or not, it remains to be seen. But it's divided social media. And Mal Horsey, who's weighed in on this one? Yeah, Matthew Richardson was on the boundary for Channel 7 on the day and said he couldn't believe his ears post-match. He labelled the booing uh, disrespectful. Uh, and called it a disgrace. But it's obviously not the first time that booing has been in the headlines of late. And Scott Pendlebury's former teammate, Dan Swan, well, he took to Twitter and chimed in. He uh, isn't too sure about the current trend, but in classic Swanee fashion, he used it as an opportunity to take a little dig at Bombers fans, calling them all sore losers and getting involved in some Twitter spats for the rest of the evening. Now, former players weren't the only ones that chimed in. Uh, Lions star Mitch Robinson, well, he was fired up. He doesn't want booing gone from the game because everyone loves passionate fans, um, but he thought the booing of Scott Pendlebury post-match uh, was not in the spirit of the game. Uh, but not everyone was offended by the incident. Uh, Hawthorne Premiership star Campbell Brown, well, he said that fans are entitled to boo and that we've all become a little bit too precious. So plenty of mixed opinions on this one. But the last one that caught my eye was actually by your dad, Kane. Uh, Graham wrote a really interesting article and basically said that common decency has gone missing when champions are being booed by the crowd, which I thought was a pretty interesting point. Kane, I wanted to get your thoughts on the booing saga. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Because the jury's out on socials. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit neutral to it. I'm not as offended by it as some are, including Dad. Look, I, the thing I'm disappointed about, Mel, is that uh, we should be talking about what an amazing game of footy it was. Yep. I think it's the best game of footy I've seen this year. So there was highlights everywhere. It was close. Both teams looked 
really strong and, and, and finals chances, no doubt. Both of them, I think they both make it. And there was just some amazing individual performances in that game and team performances as well. So we should be talking about that, not booing uh, and all the drama umpiring that's resulted as uh, the end of that game. So it was, a, it was a great game and well done to both sides. Thanks for that, Mel. Just on Twitter, do you and your dad speak before you tweet? Do you speak to... Graham no, before he flies out those tweets? No, no, I often get involved and reply to him, but uh, sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't, and yeah, I don't necessarily agree with him on that one. Okay, back to your hometown, Friday night footy, the city of churches, Port Adelaide, too good for North Melbourne, the Roos, one and five. This really looked like a tale of two different lists, two sides that went in different directions last year. Port Adelaide gutted their team, they moved on Wingard and Pollock, whether it was their choice or not remains to be seen, but they moved off. Moved on those guys, brought in the youngsters, and the Roos topped up with those guys in that 25 to 28 year bracket. And we're seeing the result of that now, aren't we, Mitch? So they both won 12 last year. They finished one game outside of the eight. Port Adelaide, as you said, moved them on. There's the players they've brought in. Now, all three of those first round draft picks you've seen, Rosie Butters and Dersmer, have played every game and the impact they've had. Whereas the Kangaroos went with the experience. So Pollock, Pittard, Hall, Tyson, we know the names. They did bring Taron Thomas in, who's had an impact, certainly, but. I just think it's fascinating. Port Adelaide, the fourth youngest list in the competition. North Melbourne, about you know the fourth or fifth oldest, and the results that that's having. So I'm just concerned as a North fan. What have you got to look forward to right now? Look through the list. Where's the next young star coming through at North? Whereas Port Adelaide, you can see it was the best draft some said in ten years last year. And Port Adelaide traded up to get Rosie. They didn't have pick five. They yeah. traded up to get him. That's what North could have done, and I just think they missed an opportunity to do that and completely re rebuild their list because it requires a rebuild now. I think we're, we're all uh, recognising where North Melbourne are at and how far they've slipped. They need to rebuild. Well, perhaps they could have done it last year, but also brought in some young talent like Port Adelaide did to play some games and fast-track that process. And two of the young Roos stars, Jai Simpkin and Paul Hearn, were dropped from this game as well, so that's just some more young midfield depth falling out of their side. You spoke about Connor Rosie. How about his game? His first six games, it looks like it could be anything at this level. He does. Uh, I, I just couldn't be more impressed with him. And we're just going to compare him to Sam Walsh. There's been a little bit of talk about this on social media and, and who would you take first. I, I'm, I'm firmly, and people will say I'm biased, I'm firmly in the Connor Rosie camp from what I've seen so far. We're six games in. There's the numbers. And Walsh's numbers, look at them. They're, they're so impressive and probably shade Rosie's numbers. But... You've got to factor in, Walsh is playing in the midfield where no one plays on each other anymore. It's the easiest position to play on the ground because you don't have a direct opponent. But those 26 disposals that Walsh is having... Pretty effective, is yeah. he not, That's going to be 35 in a couple of years. Yeah, potentially, but I just think match winners don't grow on trees. Now, this is a kid, Rosie, who is a defender. He's drafted as a defender. They thought, well, he's too good not to be in the side, but we can't fit him in across half-back, so let's play him as a forward, which is the hardest position on the ground, and this is what he's doing. He's kicked nine goals for the year, including five in one game. In the hardest spot on the ground, he can sit on people's heads, as we saw on Friday night. He can do it on the ground. He's got genuine speed and match-winning ability. Now, Walsh is going to be probably a Hall of Famer. He's going to be an All-Australian. He's going to play 250, 300 games. He's going to be in the mould of a, a Nigel Lappin type and having an amazing career, but I see Rosie as more as that genuine powerful midfielder who will move there and, and do things like the Nat Fifes of the world will do. So I'm picking Rosie from what I've seen right now and, and I'd have him not far behind the rising star race just at the moment. That might be tough for St Kilda fans. Listen, we get to see Max King but the Saints seriously consider Rosie with pick four. Hard to judge until we do see yeah. King as well and you know, you know they went for the, the the best available is what they thought, but um, hopefully he gets his body sound. Alan Richardson is confident that he's almost ready to go, uh, Max King, so really looking forward to seeing him play. But for Saints fans to see what Rosie's doing and having an immediate impact now, they'd want to hope this King kid's good. Oh, the upside is huge on him. To the rest of the round's action, Hawthorne and Carlton in Launceston. A bit of doubt around Ben McAvoy. They've flown John Segler down to Launceston. Huge opportunity for Carlton to win, uh, to win arrive. Tipped Hawthorne, but wouldn't at all be surprised if Carlton can get their game going and really challenge Hawthorne. And then this one's going to be interesting as well. I think West Coast are a proud footy club. They'll be really disappointed by what they served up on the big stage last week, and I expect a strong response from them. They've dropped Nathan Vardy, the former cat. They've just gone with a one Ruckman. The right call. They were pretty up and down in the first couple of weeks, those Ruckman. Yeah, I think now that uh, Kennedy's back in the side and Fear, you've got Darling there, I think they've got enough height. So the one more thing for this week. Buddy Franklin wasn't on the park today. That hamstring tightness getting the better of him. He still can't avoid the cameras, though. How about this? <laughs> he knows where they are. He's a, he's, a, he's a showbiz man, isn't he? He knows exactly what he's doing. Disappointing he wasn't there because, well, they're a completely different side when he's in there.
you've played with him before in that Dream Team game all those years ago. Has he got the most swag you've ever seen? Yes. Okay. Outstanding. Superstar. Thanks for that, Kane. Thank you. Thanks for Mel. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place, right here on The Round So Far.